Indian country on safety, clinical success, and diagnostic accuracy of transgenic neurobiopsy. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'll start off with a presentation on the safety, technical success, diagnostic accuracy, and of transregular liver biopsy in adults and children with native and liver transplants. So just starting off with our patient selection protocol, essentially we perform liver biopsies to the transregular routes, routes where um, percutaneous liver biopsy is contraindicated, which may be because of a high bilirubin, <laughs> with irritated dilatation, perihepatic ascites, a cardiopathy, or in patients where other transvenous procedures are indicated as measuring pressures. We need to make sure the IGV is patent, as is the pina cava and the hepatic veins. And then from the coagulopathy point of view, we aim for a hemoglobin of more than 80, INR less than 1, point, so less than 1.5, platelets of more than 50, and we correct those if there are normal triathlete procedure. If they're on heparin, we recommend it stopped for 12 hours, novel oral anticoagulants for two days, and antiplatelets for five days. We then make sure the patient is able to lie supine and cooperate the procedure, or alternatively, that this is done under general anesthesia. So for the group that I'll discuss today uh, is between 2015 and 2018, over a 30 month period, we performed a total of 298 biopsies with a more or less even split between men and women. And as you can see, there's a, a relatively high proportion of liver grafts. And during this time, we examined 14 children, 12 with native livers, and two with liver transplants. So just as an illustration of it, you can see our children's population in particular was quite widely spread between the ages of 5 and 17 in low numbers and then predominantly adults. How do we do it? Well, we started with our WHO checklist, which was completed, sedations on board, or the general anesthesia is effective, and then we safe to proceed. Set up the sterile field, administer local anesthetic, and obtain intrajugular venous access and the ultrasound with a knife from sheath. Get into the hepatic circulation, perform phonography, if it's satisfactory and we're in a stable position, we insert our biopsy set and obtain a core. Examine the core, and if it's satisfactory, we may usually take a second core or keep sampling until we have a satisfactory um, core for this pathology and then finish and recover the patient. Most of our procedures or half are performed by consultants, the other 36% by registrar and a consultant and 14% uh, was done by registrars alone. In terms of our access size, we generally go for the right internal jugular vein, occasionally for the left where either the right is not possible or the anatomy favors access via the left side. And again, most of the time we sample through the right hepatic or middle hepatic vein and occasionally through the left hepatic vein, for example, for split routes. In terms of our technical success, 97% of the time we obtain samples and in the 3% of the cases, uh, on two occasions we had a tight IPC stenosis. Uh, on two, in two cases we were unable to negotiate the HOK junction. In four cases we felt we were too unstable to safely deploy the needle and obtain the sample. And in one case the right jugular was blocked and the left radiocephalic was blocked. So we generally take two samples, but as you can see, we can take between one and five. And in 99% of the cases, the histopathologist feels the sample has been sufficient, and they further grade into an optimal or suboptimal sample as judged by the number of biliary tracts uh, that they can see. So if it's um, less than six, they really may want to be insufficient. In the three cases where that has been the case, two were for suspected autoimmune hepatitis, one of whom had sickle cell disease, and the two cores that were obtained were too fragmented, and one patient had a Bacchiari syndrome, five samples were taken, but they were all too fragmented for the transcable approach. So in terms of our complications, again, the vast majority of patients have no complications or signs of complications at all. In 3% of cases, Further imaging was required because three patients had shortness of breath. 
uh, four patients experienced abdominal pain after the procedure. One had some neck swelling, which showed the cervical hematoma, and one had transient hypertension. All of those cases who had hemorrhaging that required no intervention, things resolved spontaneously, and one patient had hemorrhage well, which I'll describe shortly. We reviewed the complications by reviewing patient notes over 30 days, and then I reviewed any available subsequent imaging to look for any silent complications on CT or MR. In terms of children, all the children underwent technically successful procedures with diagnostic samples and no complications. On the one occasion where we did have a complication, we started off with a stem stable patient who underwent a standard graft transjugular liver biopsy. Following the procedure, over a period of time, they developed tachycardia and then hypertension. They underwent a CT at 12 hours post the procedure, which demonstrated an intrahepatic parenchymal hematoma and active bleeding, which was embolized. They were then taken to theater to have the hematoma evacuated and made an uneventful recovery and again made a stable patient hands. So just to summarize, in terms of our safe practice standards, we find that if you correct the bleeding risk and have approach options, potentially use two planes of fluoroscopy and ultrasound to tell you where you are in the liver, and then you're ready to perform a CT. There are signs of hemorrhage and are ready to embolize and perform surgery. Um, so we find to be a safe pair of hands for this procedure. Thank you very much. Thank you for the uh, presentation and giving uh, the time. Uh, any questions on the floor? <coughs> yes, please. You stop aspirin. Yes, we stop both aspirin and the Could you just wait for the microphones, please? Because you're being recorded and uh, they'd like you just to wait so you can hear the question. Yeah. Do you stop aspirin? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask a question? Uh, in terms of indication, uh, our pathologists are now uh, setting up probably another new indication uh, for a patient who comes in with uh, acute hepatitis and uh, clinically not particularly well, uh, despite the fact that the clotting is normal and no ascites <coughs> and we have to do transgender evolution of the hepatitis biopsy. Do you have that experience in your center? We do because we've been part of a trial, and the reason we've approached a transjugular approach for this uh, patient was because they wanted to measure pressures at the same time. So we would measure the pressures and obtain the biopsy at the same time. But if we don't to measure the pressure? If, if, if there was no indication to measure the pressure, then we would discuss the options of why is it pertinent to obtain a transjugular biopsy and would a percutaneous biopsy suffice? Uh, just from the clotting point of view, do you have cutoff for your INR platelets for the we do, yes. because we lost these patients will have liver sub sub so. We would correct the platelets if they were less than fifty and the INR if it was less than more than one point five. So you would have to see that the INR is more than one point five now? Because many of them, some, some of these patients would have clotting disorders that you would have. They would, we would perform the procedure with a transfusion at the time of the procedure. Uh, just one question. Thanks, nice talk. Um, what technique do you use for your pressure <coughs> measurement? So straightforward wrenched battered pressure. What, what technique do you use? For, for the pressure of yes. the biopsy so For the pressure reduced. Okay, so we start off by doing a hepatic venogram to, to confirm the, which vein we're in and the anatomy. We then wedge uh, the catheter, most often a full French multi purpose catheter, and we generally wedge it fairly centrally in the liver. But that would be a wedged pressure. We then mobilize the catheter into the free hepatic vein, measure the pressure there, and then work our way back into the IVC of the right atrium. So you take sample measurements as you progress backwards? Correct. Yeah. And we do that before we take the sample. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, it's time now. Okay, thank you. Next.